know me, my name is Jeremiah Fioravanti. I'm the president of the Delaware County Institute of Science, and I'd like to welcome you here this evening uh, for this uh, Zoom lecture on Pi Day. Uh, I believe it's going to be very interesting. We've had these virtual lectures for our second year, uh, and we're currently going to start planning our, our next year's lectures, and I think we're going to be planning for mostly in person with some uh, virtual lectures in the wintertime, uh, which to take advantage of this new technology and how it's working. Um, I want to encourage you to become members and get involved with the DCIS. We've got a recent remodel of our bathroom downstairs to be more welcoming. We're considering um, an opening to the public once a week in April. So please come on by for that. It'll probably be Thursdays. And I think we'll have some students on a volunteer week from Williamson Trade School to um, basically get us a fresh coat of paint uh, downstairs at the Institute. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Laura Gurdon from Penn State and Dr. Dan King from Drexel for uh, providing uh, this Zoom lecture and the support for it. Um, basically, uh, at this point, um, I'd invite you back to our next month's lecture, and I will turn the mic over to uh, Dr. Gurdon. Great. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. So tonight, we have something that is new and unique to our lecture series. This is, again, going to be an interactive lecture, and I do not believe we have had a lecture on Pi Day, certainly not a lecture on Pi Day about Pi before. So uh, let me introduce you to Dr. Melanie Fraser, who is an assistant professor of mathematics at Southern New Hampshire University. She has a PhD and a master's, Master of Arts in Mathematics from Dartmouth and two bachelor's degrees from Middlebury College, one in mathematics and the other is in Chinese. So tonight she's gonna to talk to us about Pi Day and talking about um, exploring irrational numbers and what does th exactly that mean and what are we gonna learn and how could we actually draw it? So if you have any questions during tonight's lecture, please use the chat. The chat is open and we will, uh, ask Dr. Fraser these questions along the way. So please don't hesitate. You don't need to wait to the end to ask your questions. Again, make sure you have paper, something to write with, and a ruler that's handy for an activity we have later on during this evening's activity. So Dr. Fraser, I'm gonna turn everything over to you now. Great. Hi, everybody. Happy Pi Day. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can we all see the paper? My hands, we're good? Yes, Amazing. we can, we're good. <laughs> all right, so um, as we as we do this, most, most of the stuff that I'll have you do sort of interactively will be at the end, but um, please do feel free to ask questions if you're confused about something or something I say sparks an idea about something else, throw it in the chat and we'll, we'll talk about it as we go. Um, the first thing that we want to talk about, uh, well, obviously it's Pi Day, so we want to talk about Pi. And in particular, Pi generally we associate with circles for some reason, so I'm actually going to start with a circle. Um, and this is actually something you can follow along with at home too, if you have anything that is circular. So like, I don't know, a water bottle or a mug or something. But um, I'm, I have this circle. And I went ahead and I gave myself a little mark so I could keep track of where I am on the circle. And what I want you to imagine is imagine I have a string wrapped all the way around this circle. I want to unroll this string and see how long it is. So in order to measure my circle, I want to unroll the string that's wrapped around and see how long it is. So the reason why I put a mark is so that I can keep track of where I am. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put down my circle. I'm going to put a little mark here. And then I'm just going to go ahead and unroll this circle until I reach back to the same mark. Okay. So let's connect these. And this is going to be the length of that string. That is a little bit slanted. Sorry about that. This is going to be the length of that string. So this is the length of the length of our circle, if you will. How long is this? Well, we don't really have a way of, well, ignore the fact that I just put down a ruler. We don't have a way of measuring this. So let's measure it using the circle itself. So let's see how many times our circle can fit on this line. So if I put the circle on the line, there's one time, twice, and three times, and a little bit. Okay. Let's try with a different size. So here, here's a smaller circle. It's a fake penny. 
Um, like I said, you can use anything that's circle shaped. Um, I went ahead and put put my mark on on Liberty there. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and again we're gonna put a little mark, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna unroll this circle because we want to see how long that string around the edge will be. So here I've reached my little point again. Let's find that line. And we want to see how many times that circle fits in the in the line. So again, we've got oops, sorry. There we go. We've got the circle fits one time. And it fits two times and three times. And there's just a little bit left over. All right, let's do one more. We just did two little circles. What if we have a gigantic circle? Um, this is the biggest circle I could get and still fit on a sheet of paper. So we'll put our little mark. Uh, actually, I think that's going to be too close. I'll move it a little bit over. We're going to put our mark here. And let's unroll it and hopefully we don't run out of paper as we go. And he just made it amazing. All right, so here's our marks on our paper. I almost ran out. This is the length of this circle. And again, we want to see how many times is this going to fit. So I'm going to go ahead and put it on. We've got one time. We've got two times, three times, and there's a little bit left over. It turns out this always happens. No matter what size of circle you have, if you unroll that circle and you put it down on the line, it's going to show up on that line three times in a little bit. So it'd be really nice if we had a name for this because it shows up with every single circle that we're going to try it with. Um, so we've got three and we've got you know, a, and a little bit, three and change. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna call this pi. That is what pi is. <laughs> pi is the number of times that a circle fits inside of the of the unrolling of that circle, if you will. Does anyone know what that would be called? The the string that's sort of wrapped around the outside of the circle. What is what is that length called? Anyone know? Go ahead and type into the chat if you yeah. think you know. There's a couple names we could call it, but there's probably one you heard in high school if we can remember back to them. Yep, circumference. Has that is circumference. Yeah. So we when we unrolled, we were getting the circumference of the circle. So the circumference is going to equal uh pi times. Well, how many times do so we fit the circle in pi times? What do we call sort of fitting the circle in? What is this length of fitting the circle in? Does anyone know that one? Someone type diameter. Diameter, absolutely. So the circumference is pi times the diameter because the diameter fits inside of the circumference pi times. And probably um, when you were in high school, uh, you actually saw the formula as 2 pi r. This is because there are two radii inside of a diameter. So a radius is just half the diameter. So this is where that formula comes from. This formula doesn't come out of nowhere. We can literally find it by unrolling the circle and trying to fit the circle on the line. OK, so, um, so that's pi. What else do we know about pi? What um what is interesting about it? Why why do we care? Aside from the fact that it has to do with circles and circles are amazing. Any ideas? I, I may wait until someone puts something in the chat. Someone said it's irrational. It's irrational. Ooh, that's a good word. What does irrational mean? Someone also said non-repeating decimals. Non-repeating decimals. Okay, so um, typically what people think of is that non-repeating decimal one. Typically when people think about pi, they think about the fact that you have decimal points that just keep on going into infinity. Um, and the word for that is irrational. So whoever put that in, excellent job. Um, so in order to find irrational, like what does that really mean? 
Um, it's a lot easier to define its opposite. So it's a lot easier to, de to define rational numbers. So uh, a rational number is a number that we can write as a fraction. So if I can write it as P over Q, where P and Q are whole numbers, then that is a rational number. Um, to help you kind of remember this, rational number is a ratio of two numbers. Um, and when I say whole numbers, what do, what do I mean by that? Um, I, I mean that if you have your decimal point, there's only zeros afterwards. So uh, another word for this, if you're feeling a little bit more mathy is integers. So these are numbers like one, two, five, negative 37, but uh, no decimal points afterwards except for zero. Yeah. So this is a rational number. Does anybody have any idea what an irrational number would be? I know you guys know this. You can figure it out. If a rational number is is can be written as a fraction, an irrational number is everything else. Yeah. So an irrational number is just a number that is not rational. This feels obvious, but let's go ahead and give it a name anyway. All right. So um, a couple of questions arise when you think about irrational numbers. Um, one question is, uh, why do we care? Do we ever use irrational numbers aside from the fact that pi is pretty and we have a whole day about it? Um, are there ever any other circumstances where we use irrational numbers? Uh, that is, if someone actually has an answer to that, go ahead. Um, but that's mostly a rhetorical question. Um, does anyone know any other irrational numbers? Also, before we before we keep going, any any other ideas of irrational numbers that you can think of? Someone asked, is e irrational? Ooh, e is irrational. All right, so we've got pi, we've got e. Any other ones? How about I? Okay, I is not irrational. I is uh, a bit more complicated than that. I is the square root of negative one. So it's an imaginary number. But excellent guess. Basically anything that has a symbol and a name probably is irrational. Um, so I was, was a very good guess. Um, you ever heard of the golden ratio? That's irrational. How about H bar? H bar. I don't even know what that means. Oh, we have a real mathematician in the crowd. <laughs> All right. Um, any others? Oops, something else just appeared. Uh, H bar is Planck's constant. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So we've got some some physicists. I'm I am not a physicist. All right. Uh, another common one, square root of two. Have you heard of square root of two? We have, okay. So um, a couple of questions arise from that. this. One is how do we know that they are irrational? And we'll get to that in a second. Um, but another one is why, why might we use this? Um, and I'll give you just a very, a uh, small example of where we might use something like the square root of two. Uh, so the international paper sizes, this is not the paper sizes we use here, but the paper sizes uh, that the rest of the world uses um, are the, the A series. And you've probably heard of the, the size that's closest to our eight and a half by 11 is A4. Um, What's special about the A series and why the rest of the world uses it is the idea is they want to have a piece of paper where um, if I take the ratio of sort of the long side by the short side, if I cut it in half, then I want to have that ratio be the same. The reason why I want this is for scaling purposes. So if I want to get, if I want to take a piece of paper and I want to uh, shrink it by a half, I want to be able to fit two pages into one sheet of paper. Um, you might have noticed if you've ever tried to do this on our paper that it doesn't work very well. 
Um, you'll either get warping or you'll have weird margins or things like this. So the international paper sizes try to do it where you can actually scale without warping. Okay. So, um, so they want this ratio that's going to be fixed when you cut the paper in half. So with this paper, now the long side is still the same width, um, but now it's the long side. Um, and then this side is going to be half of the length. So what are we looking for? What do we want that ratio to be? Well, if, I, if I'm looking at a fraction where I've got sort of the long end over the short end, I've got L over W for the big piece of paper. And I want this ratio to match. Uh, now the long side is W, so W over one half of the length. So I want those ratios to match. Uh, so I want to figure out what this ratio is. So I'm going to start by cross multiplying. So I've got one half length squared equals width squared. Um, but this isn't exactly what I want. What I actually want is length over width, and I want that to equal a number. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to divide both sides by w squared and multiply both sides by two. If this is too much arithmetic and algebra for you guys, it's okay. Just believe me as I'm, as I'm going through. Um, so we've got L squared over w squared is going to equal to two. And now I don't actually want L squared over W squared. I want L over W. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to square root both sides. So that's going to give me L over W is going to equal to the square root of two. So the international paper sizes are entirely predicated on the idea that the ratio of the length to the width is going to be square root of two. So this is uh, a use of an irrational number. We actually haven't shown that it's irrational yet, but a use of square root of two. And in particular, this is used in all kinds of sort of graphical scaling, right? So if you want to scale sort of anything, you're probably going to come up with a square root somewhere. All right. So this is another use for it. OK, so I just said that square root of two was L over W, which looks like a fraction. But we're claiming that square root of two is irrational, but that looks to me like a fraction, which is what we call the rational number. Why, why did we not break anything? Why can we do that? No ideas? No right. responses. No responses. OK, we're still getting used to the interactive thing. That's OK. So this, to me, looks like I've got a, a ratio. So that looks to me like it should be a rational number. The thing, though, is if this were a rational number, these L and W would have to be whole numbers. So let's see. Let's see what would happen if, if that's the case. So let's, let's suppose that uh, our square root of 2 is rational. Right, because we haven't actually shown that irrational numbers exist. We don't actually know. I'm telling you that pi is an irrational number, and we kind of know this in the back of our heads. But how how do we actually know? How do we know that if we didn't try number after number after number and try all these different ratios, that we wouldn't finally hit one that actually equal to it? Well, let's see. Let's see. So suppose that square root of two is rational then what would that mean? Well, that would mean that if I have my L over W here, that equals to the square root of two, um, then L and W would be whole numbers. Okay, so this is the key assumption for, for making something a rational number is I would need the top and the bottom of my fraction to be whole numbers. Okay. So if it's rational, these are whole numbers. So here's what we're going to do. We know that square root of two is, is not rational. We know it's irrational. So our, our game plan here is to say, I'm supposing it's rational. I'm going to see what that means if I keep on going. And then at the end, I'm going to run into some kind of contradiction. I'm going to contradict myself. Because if I contradict myself, then my original assumption must have been false. right? So I'm going to start by assuming it's rational. I'm going to keep on going and see where that leads me. And hopefully, I'm going to run into a contradiction that'll say, I guess it couldn't be rational. It must be irrational. This is called a mathematical proof. 
Um, some of you may have seen proofs uh, in sort of high school geometry. Um, that is baby proofs. We're going to do an actual proof here. Um, but this is basically just an argument to say, why does this work? So this is what mathematicians do with their time is write proofs. All right. So if square root of two is rational, then uh, then it can be written as a ratio where L and W are whole numbers. Uh, and then where do I want to go from there? Um, well, let me actually redefine. Let's let A and B uh, be whole numbers where uh, it equals to L and W. And this is just the most simplified form of the fraction. So what do I mean by this? Most simplified form. So what I mean by this is, let's do maybe a little example so we can kind of see what this means. So side note, let's assume for our little example that L is maybe six and W is four, then L over W would be six over four, but I can simplify that. Right, this is not the most simplified form. I can simplify that to be three halves. So in this case, my A would be three and my B would be two. So I'm saying, all right, I'm saying I can write square root of two as a fraction. And in fact, this is the most simplified form of that fraction. Okay, so then I know that the square root of two is gonna equal to A over B. Um, I don't love that there's a square root there, so I'm going to go ahead and square both sides. So two is going to equal to a squared over b squared. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't really love that there's a fraction either, so I'm going to go ahead and multiply through. So I've got two b squared equals a squared. All right. Dr. Fraser, I hate to interrupt, but I think yeah. when you when you had the six over four it became three over two, someone put in the chat, AKA a reduced fraction. Yes, exactly. So basically what we're doing with that A over B is we want to get the most reduced fraction that we can, right? Um, because that'll make it, that'll give us, what, what do I wanna say? There are infinitely may, many ways to express a fraction. So by saying it's the most simplified form, we're basically pulling the unique way right, or a unique way so that we can deal with it more easily. Okay, so 2b squared equals a squared. This actually tells us something because if a number is divisible by two, then it is even, right? This is something that hopefully we know. So we just found out that a squared is even. Okay, awesome. I actually don't really care about a squared though. I wanna know about a and b because they're the ones where if I take their ratio, they're equaling square root of two. So, but if a squared is even, then a is even. Side note, does anybody know why that is? I can actually figure this out in a, in a actual side note. This is why paper is the best. All right, let's do a little side note. Um, what would happen if A weren't even? So if A isn't even, what does it mean to not be even? It just means it's not divisible by two, right? Being even means you're divisible by two. So if it's not even, then it doesn't have two as a factor. Well, what would that mean? If it doesn't have two as a factor, What would that tell us about a squared? What is, what is a squared? Well, a squared is just a times a. So if a doesn't have two as a factor, a times a, where would the two come from? It couldn't come from anywhere. So this also doesn't have two as a factor. So if this doesn't have two as a factor, then it's not even. So a squared isn't even, okay. But we know that a squared is even, so a has to be even or else we would break this. All right, so a squared is even, so a is even. 
So what does that mean? That means A is also divisible by two. So A is gonna equal two times something else, some other whole number that we'll call C. We've almost proven that irrational numbers exist. All right. So A equals two times C because we know A is even. So let's go back to our formula here. We said we know that 2B squared equals A squared, but now we know that A is 2C. 2C. So if I square that, then this equals 4C squared. Let's go ahead and divide by two. So this tells us that B squared equals 2C squared. I just divided both sides by two. But <laughs> what does that tell me? So that tells me that B squared is even. So B is even. All right, so what have, we, what have we discovered? It feels like we've done a whole lot of work with not much payoff. But all that we've discovered is we've said, I've got A over B, it's the most simplified form. A is even and B is also even. So B is gonna equal to two times something else. Let's call it B. So then what does that mean? Well, if I take A over B, this is the same as saying 2C over 2D, but that can simplify. But we said that this was the most simplified form, the most reduced fraction. But we just showed that if this is the most reduced fraction, then we can still reduce it. So this is our contradiction. We just broke math. So this is our contradiction. So what we did is we started with saying square root of two is rational. We did all this work and we said, oh my goodness, there's a contradiction. That means that square root of two can't be rational. All right, amazing. That's what we were hoping for because that just proves that square root of two is irrational because if it's not rational, then it's irrational. Q, E, D. So that little square says we're done. So this is a mathematical proof. Um, there are two reasons why I show this to you. One is so that you know what mathematicians do with their days. We just write proofs. It's a great deal of fun. Um, and the other is we just prove that irrational numbers exist. That is not something that was always uh, believed. It was, in fact, well, I'll tell you a story a little bit later, but uh, there was a time when it was very firmly believed that irrational num numbers didn't exist. But we just proved that they do. Amazing. Okay. Uh, going back to the paper sizes, what does that mean about our paper sizes? Well, we just showed that square root of two is irrational, which means we can't write it as a fraction, which means if you actually want to make your paper sizes have this ratio, your lengths and your widths can't be whole numbers. Um, that's really difficult to measure. The way that uh, the international paper sizes get around this is they measure in millimeters because they're very, very small. And then they try to get as close as humanly possible. So for instance, uh, A4, I want to say is uh, 210 by 297 millimeters. So those are whole numbers. If I take their ratio, I get a rational number, but that rational number is 1.41428 and, and some more stuff. I'm saying dot, 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 because it keeps going, but it does actually end. And we know that because it's a rational number, because I just wrote it as a fraction. Whereas the square root of two equals 1.41421. So this is accurate up to four decimal places. That's pretty good. Um, so this is the way that they get around the fact that you can't actually have a ratio of sides uh, equaling to an irrational number. Dr. Fraser, we just had a yes. comment appear. If L, if L equals eight, then two must equal four. This is a contradiction you are referring to? Uh, if L equals eight, then two has to equal four. <laughs> I'm not so I feel like I'm missing a few numbers in there. It might be because you can't type in a square root sign in the chat. Uh, sure. <laughs> that's possible. That's possible. Basically, the contradiction is the fact that if these were whole numbers and I write it in the most simplified form, I can't actually come up with an example, right? Because I'll end up breaking it. There is no way to write this. Th this is our key, our key problem. 
is here. There is no way to write this in its most simplified form because square root of two is irrational. So anytime I try to write it as, as a fraction, I run into the fact that I could never reduce it far enough to not run into something like this where both would have to be even. Anthony, can you unmute yourself maybe and ask the question? I think I gave you those privileges to do so. Hello, Doctor. Uh, good evening. No, I just I just ran that through. Uh, if the two is equal to the uh, uh, the square of the denominator and the square of the numerator, then uh, you have eight over. If you had eight over four, it simplifies the two over one, and therefore a square root of two is four, and square root of one is one, and that means that two will be equal to four, and therefore the it's a contradiction. You can't have two whole numbers that are absolutely uh, different. So that's what I was referring to. It okay, illustrates. Okay, okay. I so, think it illus so eight illustrates. eight squared was your eight. Is that what you're saying? Uh, correct. Yes. Okay. That was the yep. eight squared. And yeah, and and often this is a really good way to kind of wrap your head around what's happening in a proof is to try to throw in some example numbers to kind of keep track of what's going on. Um, so even though you can't prove something by example, you can help yourself understand it a little bit better by example. So that is an excellent way to go about it. All right, any other uh, feelings about this? We're reaching the end of an arc uh, in the talk. So this is the arc of the more written mathy stuff and we're about to enter the arc of the more hands-on picture stuff. So if you got to this point and you were like, this is too many words, don't worry, I'm about to do a bunch of pictures. Any other questions on irrational numbers, feelings about the fact that we just prove they exist? Um, are we ready to keep going? I think we're all feeling pretty empowered that we broke math. So we're, we're ready we to go. We did it, on. we broke it. <laughs> So I'll tell you a secret. Mathematicians, mainly what they want to do is they want to break things. This is, this is my whole job is to try to break stuff. So you tell me, I think this is true, and I try to break it. That's, that's my whole thing. Okay. So um, great. So we have square root of two. We just showed that it's, you know, it's irrational. It goes on forever and ever and ever. So it must be really hard to measure, right? Um, medium. It is not actually impossible to measure because it turns out we can actually draw a line that is exactly square root of two long. So let's do that. Um, another yes. question, I'm sorry, appeared in the chat. I understand pi is an irrational number, but can't it be expressed as a, a ration 22 over seven? No, 22 over seven would give us a, uh, a rounding of pi. So that does not actually give us pi, that just gives us an approximation of pi, kind of like how in our, in our paper example, 297 over 210 gives us a pretty good approximation of square root of two, but it's not exact. Sorry, I should have had more, more dots. It's not exact because this is gonna go on forever. So no matter how precise we try to make this fraction, at some point, we're gonna get this difference here. Similarly with 22 over seven versus pi. So that's kind of like saying 3.14 isn't actually pi because we just stopped <laughs> listing the decimal points. Um, but it's a pretty good approximation. All right. Any other feelings? No other questions at this point. Awesome. All right. Thank you for keeping track of the chat. OK, so it turns out we actually can draw the square root of 2 even though it feels like this shouldn't be measurable because it's an irrational number that just goes on forever. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to draw, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and make this one inch, although it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to draw a line that is a certain length, and then I'm going to draw another line that is the same length. Um, so I'm going to make it also one inch at a right angle. So this is one, this is one. So now I'm gonna connect these two. And I claim that this is the square root of two. Why? Why is that the square root of two?
Pythagorean theorem. Absolutely. This is the Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean theorem is that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay. So what does this actually mean? The A and the B are the legs of our right triangle. The C is gonna be the long side. So this is called the hypotenuse of our triangle. So let's double check. If we know A squared plus B squared equals C squared, let's go ahead and plug in. So we've got A is one. So one squared plus B is also one equals C squared. So one squared is one. So one squared plus one squared is two. All right. So if I square root both sides to try to find my C, this will give me square root of two. So we just drew a line that is exactly square root of two long, square root of two inches long. Um, and reality check, let's actually check this. If I look at, I don't know how well you can see the little markings on my ruler, but if I look at this, this is just over 1.4, just under 1.5. And we said that square root of two is 1.4. Four one four two so 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 yeah so this this actually does look like it's about right so we have drawn a line that is exactly square root of two inches long um, even though square root of two is irrational and goes on forever um, that is depending on the Pythagorean theorem <laughs> why does the Pythagorean theorem work what does it actually even mean um, what does it mean? Like, okay, what does the the letter A squared, what does this mean? Any ideas? No ideas. We don't know what A squared means. That's okay. Does anyone know? Okay, well, we know what it means algebraically, right? We know that it is A times A. What does it mean geometrically? Any anybody know? Geometrically, it is a square. <laughs> so if I look at a square that's a on one side and a on another side, right? What is the area of the square? It's a times a. That's so. This is where square comes from. We're squaring a. We're literally making a square with sides of a, and that area is a squared. Is there a comment in the chat? Someone typed base squared. Yeah, the base squared. So in this case, the base is A, but yes, exactly. So this is how we're getting the square, right? Is A squared is literally the square. So what I'm claiming is, let's say I have a triangle. Here's my A, my B, and my C. I'm claiming that if I take the square of, of the A, and take the square of the B. These are the area of these two takes up, up the exact same area as this pink square of the C. This is what we're claiming. This is what the Pythagorean theorem says. Um, okay, how are we going to show that that's true? I'm going to do another proof. Before we did a proof that involved a lot of writing and uh, some algebra. Now we're going to do a different kind of proof that's entirely with pictures. So what I'm going to use for this is I'm going to look at a square that is a plus b big. Um, but before I do that, I, I actually, this is a side note. This is not really related to what we're doing, but it's interesting anyway. So I'm going to do it anyway. And you are stuck here, so you get to do it with me. Um, what is a plus b squared? Does anybody know what this is? This is, oh, we got a comment. Go Someone ahead. said the algebraic formula. The algebraic formula. Wow, that is a bold statement. Um, yeah, this is, um, this is an algebraic formula, that's for sure. A lot of freshmen in my class really want this to be a squared plus b squared this i call this the freshman stream and so do a lot of people this is called the freshman stream because we really want this to be true is this true uh in the chat we have a squared plus two a b plus b squared there we go we're missing a piece we're missing two a b um why is this true 
typically when we see this, it's because you do A plus B times A plus B and you FOIL and you're distributing things and that's where this comes from. I'm going to sh actually show you why this is true geometrically. Uh, so people really want A plus B squared to be A squared plus B squared. It's not, we have this extra 2AB. All right, so let's let's see why. And I promise this is actually medium relevant. Someone's asking about factoring. Factoring, yeah. Well, so factoring would be going the opposite way. So expanding is going like that, is taking my A plus B squared and expanding it out. If I wanted to factor, I would start on this end and go back the other way. So you're right that it's related. All right, so let me take um, a square that is, that is this is A plus B squared. Um, and how do I know this? Because I pre-measured it. So if this is length A and this is length B, then I went ahead and I lined them up. So this is this line is A plus B. So it's A plus B long on, on both sides. And you can maybe already kind of tell that the freshman dream doesn't work because A plus B squared, this square is not filled in by A squared and B squared. There, there is a lot of extra space. But if we line this up kind of creatively, how much extra space is there? Well, there's these two extra, sorry, these two extra rectangles. How big is one of these rectangles? Well, the area of the rectangle is length times width. So this rectangle has area A times B, and there are two of them left over. So that's where a geometric interpretation of where A squared plus two AB plus B squared comes from. Awesome. A okay. times B appeared in the chat. Yes, exactly. A times B. So we've got two A times B. Um, that is not uh, exactly what we're talking about, but it is fun. Uh, and in particular, I do actually want to use this for the Pythagorean theorem. So I'm going to fill in this A plus B square. I've got A squared, I've got B squared, and now I'm going to fill in these rectangles uh, with uh, each of them with two triangles. So Here's my right triangle that I started with. That's where the A and B came from in the first place. And I'm just going to get two copies of it down here to fill in that rectangle. And I'm going to get two copies up here to fill in this rectangle. Yeah. Okay. So we have now filled in A plus B squared. Now I'm claiming with the Pythagorean theorem that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So I'm claiming that if I take away the purple and the green squares, so I'm taking these off and I put in the pink square, it'll fill up the same amount of space. Okay. Can we show that this happens? Now this has to fill up the same amount of space, which means I can still get to use these four, I don't know what color that is, salmon, these four salmon triangles. Um, so here's here's how we'll do it. I'm just going to, instead of having them grouped together, I'm going to go ahead and space out these triangles into the corners. And there we go. There's our squared. So we just showed that A squared plus B squared takes up the same area as C squared does by filling in this square. And we have some extra triangle, four extra triangles with the C squared, and also those same four extra triangles if we fill it in with A and B. So that's why the Pythagorean theorem works, one reason. So this is a new kind of proof. We did the proof where we where we wrote out and did a bunch of algebra. This is also a proof, but it's a proof by picture, which is one of the more fun ways to do it. All right, any questions on the Pythagorean theorem? Do we feel good about the fact that it works? I feel good about the fact that it works, amazing. All right. Um, so now's the part where you get to draw. So we have our, um, we know that we can draw square root of two because of the Pythagorean theorem. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, if you brought a pen and paper, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna draw a length of the square root of two. So again, we'll draw, we'll do one inch by one inch, so get that to be a right angle. If you're having trouble knowing if it's a right angle, just line up your, your zero line there with the, with the line that you already drew. 
Um, so there's one and one. And when we connect them, we get square root of two. All right. So we have now drawn an irrational number. Can we draw other ones? Yes, we can. Um, there are a lot of ways to draw a lot of different irrational numbers. Um, but one really easy way is let's go ahead and take our square root of two. I'm going to go ahead and do a right angle again. And again, I'm going to draw length one. So I'm going to do one inch along my ruler. And then I'm going to connect these two ends. How long is this length? Here's my right angle, length of one. How long is this length? Well, if we actually try it with, um, with the Pythagorean theorem, now the square root of two is one of my sides instead of the long side. So I've got one squared plus, I probably should have done this further, oh well. One squared plus the square root of two, this is my other side length squared equals c squared. So one squared is one, square root of two squared is two. Is gonna equal c squared. So three equals c squared. So c is gonna be square root of three. So we just made the square root of three. And we can keep on doing this. We can build ourselves up square roots all the way around. So. That is my activity for you. I'm going to be doing it on the screen and you can do it too and see what pretty pictures we make. Um, so again, take our right angle, make one inch over and connect. And this will give us the square root of four, which is not an irrational number, that's two. So reality check. Let's go ahead and measure it. That is two inches long. So we're doing something right. Keep going. How many of these can we make? I'm going to ask people to hold up their pictures at the end. So make something. And in the meantime, we can talk about questions as people are drawing. Does anybody have any, any things they want to talk about? Maybe. All right, I'll chat with you guys um, if nobody has questions. So that's going to set off our, that little gap is going to set off our number real quick. Uh, someone is asking, I think, where does phi fall into this? PHI. PHI. Yeah, so that's going to be another, uh, another one of these ratios that ends up so that's also an irrational number. Basically, anything that has a has a fancy name is going to be an irrational number. Um, that's that's not totally solid, but a good rule of thumb. Um, and a lot of these are ratios that end up showing up in nature. So, for instance, um, the golden ratio ends up showing up a lot. I've got my my Fibonacci spiral here, which um, which utilizes that. So, yeah. It's just a, another ratio that shows up in nature that happens to be irrational. Irrational numbers show up all the time. So I promised you guys a story. Um, and my story is about Pythagoras. So Pythagoras um, had a had a cult. I, I don't know that he was actually alive while the cult was happening. I think he probably was, but then it kept on going for a couple hundred years afterwards. Um, and they were pretty weird. I mean, they were a cult, but it, they seemed like a good idea. What they, what they said is I'm going to sort of find peace and balance by examining math and examining science. And that seems pretty cool. They also had some weird beliefs though. They believed that um, you couldn't eat beans Legend has it that Pythagoras was weirdly afraid of beans, so they couldn't eat beans. They were all vegetarian, but they couldn't eat beans. And they had to do other things, like every time it thunders, they had to touch the ground, um, things like that. Um, but one thing that they believed is because they're saying, I'm finding peace by looking at math, um, they believe that sort of God made, God made math. 
and God made numbers, and so all numbers must be perfect. In particular, what that meant was that there were no irrational numbers. Um, they believed that there were no irrational numbers. And so they thought that every single number could be made by a ratio of two other numbers. And so a lot of time was spent with finding random numbers and saying, okay, what, what ratios can, can make this? Um, so one of, one of them, one of the Pythagoreans, uh, I wanna say his name was Hippasus. Um, he tried to do this with the square root of two. He said, I'm gonna keep on working and trying to find a ratio that will, uh, that will give me the square root of two. And well, we just proved that that's impossible. So he spent a lot of time trying to do that and it was not, it was not possible. But he finally figured out what we did today. He found that he proved that it was irrational, that it was impossible to find this ratio of numbers. Um, and he, he showed it <laughs> to the Pythagoreans. Um, and they did not like this very much, especially because he used Pythagoras's own theorem to, to make that square root of two. So they did not like this. And there, there's lots of legends of what then happened. Um, I think the official Pythagorean version of this is that he uh, was punished by the gods um, and drowned at sea because the gods were punishing him for doubting the amazingness of, of numbers. Um, who knows, who knows what happened to him, but he was never heard from again. So all of this goes to show uh, that even if you're focusing on, on math and science, it's important to keep an open mind and take a look at the evidence around you um, because, you know, new things might come up. So uh, so that is, that is my story about the square root of two and Pythagorean theorem. We do have a, quest a question that oh, appeared yeah. in the chat. Of course. What algorithm is used to actually compute pi, the non-repeating decimal? As mentioned, 22 over seven is only approximate. Yeah, so there, uh, I don't actually know that off the top of my head, although I can make a guess. Um, one guess is what do we want? We wanna have the ratio, oops, the ratio of the, oh wait, I actually have circles. Here we go. The ratio of the circumference of the circle to the diameter of the circle. Um, so the New York Times put out a pretty good article today talking about this, um, which is you can sort of approximate this by, by putting polygons inside. Um, and the more sides your polygon is, the closer you are to approximating a circle, right? So for instance, if I put, um, if I put a hexagon, I, I don't think I can do this freehand, but, but let's assume that we put a hexagon inside of here, right? Uh, where I'm touching the edges of my circle then that's a pretty poor approximation, but it is an approximation of the circle. And so I know that I can look at the circumference or the perimeter really of the hexagon by, by adding each piece um, together to get six times whatever those pieces are. Um, and then I can look at the diameter of the hexagon, which hopefully will be similar to the diameter of the circle. Um, why is that helpful? That gives a lower bound for pi. And if I, I just talked about putting the hexagon inside of the circle, but if I put the hexagon outside of the circle, so now I am using the circle as the inner part of the hexagon. So we've got a hexagon going like this, that'll give me an overestimate. So I'm getting an underestimate by the hexagon inside and an overestimate by the hexagon outside. So that gives me sort of bounds that pi has to be in between those two sides. Um, okay. So that'll give me some bounds. Now let me add another side. So let me look at a septagon, an octagon, a decagon, and sort of keep on adding sides to my, uh, to my polygon that's inside of my circle and outside of my circle. Um, and you know, it's impossible to have all of, to physically draw all of those for sure. And also to, to sort of calculate it because Anything that you have is still just going to be an approximation, but that's where limits come in. So you can take the limit of the number of sides of the shape inside of the circle and outside of the circle to get a tighter and tighter and tighter squeeze to get a better and better approximation. Hope that answers your question. Any other questions? How, how are our, uh, our people's shapes looking like this or did we end up looking like something else? <laughs> 
should we change the view so everyone can yeah, see? Yeah, let's change the view. Let's change the view. Let's so see what the little shapes are. If you stop sharing, then yeah, everyone's sure. grids, I bet, will appear. But everyone has their cameras off. Gallery, yeah. go ahead. And if you have your camera on, hold up your, looks like a chambered Nautilus to me. It's, it's beautiful. That's gorgeous. You kept going further than I did. That's lovely. Yeah, you guys kept going much further than I did. I, I love this. And you can keep on going sort of indefinitely. It'll wrap around on itself, though. Eventually, you're going to run out of space. Anybody else have one? I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see. Oh, and, and we've got the spiral that it's approximating. Beautiful. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so you can draw infinitely many irrational numbers by doing this because you can keep on going around that spiral you'll you'll lap yourself but you can keep on going around that spiral um until you get to whatever square root you want some of those are not going to be irrational numbers so for instance the square root of nine is three that's not irrational but a lot of them will be so you can draw infinitely many you can also draw the length of pi how can we do this well we can take a circle that is, oops, there we go. We can take a circle that is one inch in diameter. Then if we unroll that circle, we have made a line that is pi inches long. All right, any other questions? As we're getting to the end of our hour, if anyone has any last minute questions for Dr. Fraser, please do type them into the chat. Dr. Fraser, what a fun activity this was. Well, thank you all for joining me and happy Pi Day. We'll let it go just another minute if anyone is currently typing in any questions that are there. And I will um, also remind everyone that we have two more uh, talks left for our speaker series this year. The next one is Monday, April 11th. Amy Mavi from Jenkins Arboretum is going to be speaking about native spring ephemerals. So we're moving to plants. And so uh, please do join us Monday, April 11th for that one. The link to register is in the chat. So you can go to the website, register now. And uh, fingers crossed, our May lecture is going to be a little different. Um, I am supposed to be uh, on a ship and I will be doing a live lecture from a ship and that will be on a Monday afternoon. It'll be during the lunch hour instead of the evening. And the reason it's the lunch hour is so you can see the water because it'll be evening time when I'm in the South Atlantic Ocean to Zoom back with you. So both those uh, lectures have registration links uh, ready on our website. Uh, Dr. Fraser, I wanna thank you so much again. I don't know if you can see the chat. There are just some wonderful uh, comments in there. Thanking you for your time today.